Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics, or welcome back to you. Uh, it's nice to have you all here, despite uh, the sun outside there. So uh, hope you're enjoying uh, this day up till so far. Uh, this is the fourth webinar of our third Crash Course series, which is on Big Tech. Uh, and before we tell you a bit more about uh, the series and on Crash Course, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. If you'd like that, you can perhaps uh, say who you are, where you're based and what brings you here. So my name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at TNI, the Transnational Institute, and I'll be your host today. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Grohlsmith, who is our web developer and designed our awesome website, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl and Jenny Pannenbecker, who is a communications officer uh, and also at SOMO, and they're working very hard to make this webinar a success again. So uh, Crash Course, what is Crash Course? Um, we, the five of us, are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And uh, at the start of the corona crisis, we united because we wanted to understand what ha what's happening um, how the crisis will change our world and also reflect on the challenges we're faced with and, of course, think of possible solutions. Now, Crash Course is a digital platform which is designed to open up debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. In order to do so, um, every two weeks, we're inviting global experts to break down uh, complex issues and make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system together in a just and democratic way. So what we want to do is democratize knowledge about specific issues and then give you the necessary tools uh, to change the world. And this time, we decided to discuss the challenges related to some of the big uh, COVID crisis winners, such as big tech. Uh, there will be at least five and hopefully even six webinars in this series uh, every two weeks. And in each webinar, we provide you with one hour of crash course on a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. Um, important for you to know is that all our former webinars of this series, but also of the former series, uh, are published on our website, which is crashcourseeconomics.org. So there's a recording of each webinar, there is a podcast version, and there's also a written summary. So in case you've missed anything or you want to reread anything, please do so. And our former speakers of this series, which are Keen Birch, Cecilia Ricap, and Farva Sial, are already there. Uh, Rodrigo, can you uh, tell us something about this series? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. So this is the, the third uh, series of Crash Course webinars. Um, in the first uh, series, we uh, looked at central banks, uh, the role of central banks and monetary policy in contemporary capitalism, in particularly uh, since the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 crisis. In the second series, we uh, looked at the, the debt crisis in the global south, uh, what structural elements are new uh, and what is the same. Um, in this third series, we are focusing on, uh, on a sector uh, that well, houses some of the biggest winners from, from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so these are uh, big tech firms, the, dig the digital monopolies of our world uh, with immense corporate power. Um, so, as we've all seen, uh, the COVID-19 period was uh, a catalyst for, for essentially for the big techification of everything. Uh, the world was put on a, on a tech diet uh, and 2020 accelerated many developments that had started to take shape in the years before. And what we saw was that tech uh, and big tech firms in particular transformed from being a helping hand, innovators, or simply a force for good uh, into these immensely powerful corporations uh, with well, many problems attached to them. Um, so to understand uh, the complex cluster of issues uh, that well, evolves around big tech and the big techification, uh, we have decided to break this down into five different episodes. Uh, and throughout the series, we have been moving slowly towards discussing uh, policy options uh, and solutions and ways to fight back and re-regulate the sector. Uh, so the first two episodes were uh, dedicated into 
uh, taking stock of what is it that we know, what is the broader view, and introduce some uh, key concepts, concepts such, such as uh, platforms, uh, rent, rentier capitalism, uh, and intangible assets. Um, in the last, uh, in the previous episode, we, we focused on uh, uh, the EU competition uh, policy, law, uh, uh, how it is evolving, uh, and uh, what the limitations of competition uh, law is. Um, in this episode, we will uh, take a, a closer look at issues and solutions uh, from the perspective of the Global South. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thanks a lot, Rodrigo, for this uh, uh, illuminating introduction. So just a few uh, practicalities before we start off. Uh, so the setup of the webinar is, as always, the following. Uh, Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker, uh, who will uh, give her presentation, her view, in about 15 minutes. And thereafter, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions for her, which we will ask her in another time slot of 15 minutes. And finally, uh, there's lots of space for you to ask questions. And those questions will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. So in total, it will be one hour. And if you have a question, uh, you can put it in the special Q&A uh, tab or window, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen during the webinar. And we'll make a selection based on those questions that are favored most. So that means that if you like a question a lot, you can upload it by putting the thumbs up and then automatically it appears at the top of our screen. So if you like a question, you can endorse it and then uh, the, the chances that it will be read out loud are quite extensive and big. So Rodrigo, you have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yes, well, we are very happy uh, to have uh, Nandini Chami uh, with us today. Uh, she's uh, the deputy director uh, at IT for Change. Uh, this is an NGO based in India. Um, her work focuses on uh, research and advocacy uh, at the intersections of digital policy, uh, development, justice, and, and gender equality. Uh, IT for Change, uh, more broadly, uh, aims for a society uh, in which digital technologies contribute to human rights, social justice, uh, and an equal society. And yeah, invite everyone uh, really to scroll through uh, the website and, and the, the publications. Uh, it is uh, very rich. Uh, it's a very rich knowledge center, uh, uh, which has writings on many, many interesting topics. Uh, and uh, well, I, I, we're very happy to have Nandini with us today. And I would like to ask her to put on uh, her, uh, her microphone and her camera and, uh, and start uh, with the presentation. Yeah, and I will uh, I will assist her in uh, giving that presentation by sharing my screen and um, entering into slideshow so you have a good view of what's going on. Uh, yeah, uh, Sarah, can you just go to the first slide? Uh, yeah, first? let me just yeah. go back. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there we are. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just want to begin by uh, discussing uh, how I feel that uh, this webinar series is extremely important because uh, big tech is the defining uh, force of our economic force of our epoch. And just like in the industrial age when the industrial corporations came and society changed, this constitutive like uh, remaking of society we are seeing in the big tech age. And what I would attempt to do like in our contribution from IT for Change to the series of thinking through the question of how we can take on big tech is to try and provide a view from the global south and zero in on some uh, specific uh, questions. Uh, can I have the next slide? So I want to uh, begin by clarifying what I mean when I use the term uh, big tech. Usually in common parlance, big tech is often referred to uh, speak to a handful of companies like Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and so on. But it's important to remember that it's not just any particular set of companies, but big tech should be understood as a conceptual heuristic referring to a business model characterized by an ever-expanding web of stakes that is built on the network data effect of platform infrastructures and the associated capture of data value chains. So the 
platform business model that relies on monopoly rents generated through control over network data infrastructures, which we at IT for Change like to call the intelligent corporation. This is what big tech is about. So it means that just like Alphabet or Microsoft are big tech, we also have wannabe big, tech, big techs in the global south, like Mercado Libre, for instance, in the Latin American region, or Reliance Geo uh, in the Indian context. Next slide. So now uh, I want to talk about how, when we view the intelligent corporation from the lens of the global south, a critical point that we have to remember is how uh, the intelligent corporations onward march in the quest that capital always has to always expand and to relentlessly pursue the profit motive. It is deepening existing geographies of economic inequality and also refashioning those geographies and creating new inequalities. What does this mean? Let's go to the next slide. So to whom is the value of data that is central to the big tech business model accruing? Like you can see from uh, this world map generated from uh, Rodrigo's own uh, and his colleagues uh, research at SOMO, uh, big tech market capitalization, who, where are the biggest big tech corporations today? They are either US corporation or Chinese corporations, and they might be extracting data from the rest of the world, and there is a new data colonialism, but the value of that is accruing to these corporations and by extension to mainly two economies in the world, the US and China. And it's not just about like the value, but it's also the potential for future value because who holds the maximum amount of patents, intangible assets, and the earning potential for future value in the data economy? It is these countries. And there is also an extreme skew in economic development uh, prospects like the UNTAD has pointed out. Next slide. And the biggest uh, proof for this actually comes from a perusal of like how market capitalization has changed over the years. On this slide, I just have put in the graph for 2019. If you were to go to the source and look at the graph for 1999, you would be surprised actually, or maybe not so surprised because it would be predominated by industrial corporations. But in the data age, what is happening is that if you look at the top 10 list of the biggest corporations by market capitalization, seven of them are big tech companies. There are even two Chinese companies, right? Alibaba and Tencent. So the skew is most visible in the market capitalization graphs because as always, the numbers talk. Next slide. And uh, I think we should look at like some specific strategies through which the uh, big tech companies retain their domination uh, and they skew in these, this economic system uh, further. And I would like to describe some of these uh, strategies. Next slide. So one route which is actually a much older route, and this has uh, taken a lot of importance in the big tech age, uh, is acquisitions, mergers, and investments. So we see that whether it be the US big tech, that is the GAFAM, or Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent from China, big tech firms often have the strategy of acquiring promising startups, scouting and grabbing up potential competitors, and branching out in to complementary sectors. So there is a deepening of like investments in the technology end as well. And there is also acquisition of allied sectors, which is very beautifully illustrated in the Amazon story that we all know today. And very interestingly, the pandemic does not seem to have reversed these trends at all. There is a UN Economist Network report of 2020, which observes how the monthly acquisitions by big tech companies have actually gone up post pandemic. Within the global south, there will also be a scramble for like these capital investments from big tech. For instance, after the pandemic, Africa seems to be the only geography that is struggling a little bit with respect to getting these big tech investments. Between India and Southeast Asia, there is a geopolitical battle where uh, a change in India's foreign direct 
direct investment law is actually turning away Chinese technology investors from India and pushing them into Southeast Asia. And we can actually see that uh, this vacuum is getting rapidly filled up by uh, potential US uh, big tech investors making uh, moves in India. So this kind of like scramble happens as the global South economies compete with uh, one another uh, for investments largely from uh, Chinese and uh, US uh, big tech companies. Next slide. We also see that between finance capital and uh, big tech, uh, there is actually a very happy marriage and this is not uh, surprising. Uh, just take the case of Africa, where fintech is one of like the sectors that is expected to rapidly develop in the coming years and uh, will grow and recover fast after the pandemic. Also, we can see who are the payment giants, who are the investors in the African fintech sector. As the graph shows, they are the global payments giants, MasterCard, Visa, Stripe, PayPal, and these are the companies that they have. Uh, similarly, in India, we are also seeing this uh, new age trend where retail payment systems, digital payment systems are being now proposed to be set up through consortiums where big tech companies and uh, commercial banks, private sector commercial banks will come together. Uh, as of now in India, this system is maintained by the central bank with nationalized uh, public sector banks, but there is an opening up of digital payments to private capital for evident reasons. And this is going to bring about a lot of like uncertainty and flux, but these kind of developments are important to track in the uh, South, especially from the point of view of the health of economies. Um, the third, next slide. Um, I want to talk about uh, this phenomenon called uh, ideologization, where capital has always used uh, discursive power to retain uh, its domination and also its uh, hegemony, right? And this we can see even by intelligent corporations, that is by big tech. So at the World uh, Trade Organization, there are plurilateral negotiations on e-commerce that are rapidly unfolding. And in, through these plurilateral negotiations, the US and its trade allies and even the European Union are pushing for unrestricted cross-border data flows, hyper-liberalized access to digital services markets, and prohibitions on source code disclosure, all of which are inimical to the interests of the uh, economies of the global south. And what is interesting is that when plurilateral negotiations happen at the WTO, this means that the rule for future multilateral uh, uh, rulemaking, this room gets completely taken away and developing countries which are not at the table do not have a say in the system. And this actually like takes away their power to shape their economic development trajectories for the future. And on the left, you can see that I have put in a picture from uh, MC11, the previous uh, WTO uh, conference, uh, where there was actually an uh, entire exercise created by the uh, proponents of the plurilateral on how liberalized access to digital commerce markets is extremely beneficial to the interests of women of developing countries and their economic empowerment. And there was a declaration on women and trade where women's empowerment was used as a Trojan horse to push through this particular hyper-liberalized e-commerce agenda. So this kind of ideological manipulation where the interests of MSMEs, the interests of women are often mask other strategic trade interests. This is something that the uh, corporations of uh, US and China are able to, uh, of US Saudi in particular, are able to persuade their countries to do. And interestingly, China is also in the plurilateral, though it has like historically different views on these matters from the US and its allies. But that is something I think I can talk about a little bit later uh, when we have a discussion. Uh, the next slide. So now I want to come to one point which is like uh, extremely tricky that I think we all recognize that we are living in an age where the climate is one of growing illiberalism, right? And after the pandemic, especially for many of us in different contexts in the global South, we are extremely concerned about checking the power of the state. 
But what's happening here is that big tech companies are actually uh, playing on this uh, climate of, of fear and this whole concern about civic liberties in ways that essentially suit their business interests, like we can see in the case of uh, WhatsApp in India. So like you might all have heard, in India, WhatsApp proposed this privacy policy update, which it had proposed in many markets other than the EU, where because of the GDPR, uh, people were allowed to have this opt-out of WhatsApp sharing their data with uh, Facebook. Uh, but in India, that opt-out was never given. At the same time, when the Indian government proposed a law where uh, it wanted to trace originator information of WhatsApp messages uh, in cases for, let's say, investigating unlawful activities, uh, WhatsApp actually filed a petition in the Supreme Court about how it can't comply with these changes because uh, actually complying with these changes would mean uh, violating privacy rights. So there is a selective championing of privacy here. I'm not getting into the merits and demerits of the Indian law because that's a separate discussion. And I just am trying to say that uh, the uh, big tech is able to use like the overall sentiment about civic liberties very well to further its market power. And this is an extremely difficult situation for citizens in the South because it's like we are caught in the Greek myth of like, you know, skill and charities, right? Like which monster do you pick? And is this a situation do you want to be in? And one needs to have a lot of thinking here about not picking either the state or the capital and and still trying to preserve uh, human rights in their integrated uh, sense. Next slide. So now uh, just coming to uh, a set of proposals that maybe I think all of us in the room understand this problem. And if we have to tame big tech, what's the kind of like a digital new deal for the global South? I bring to the table some thoughts from IT for Change. Next slide. One thing is that uh, we need multilateral cooperation to actually protect human rights against the state corporate uh, nexus. And this means that a lot of multilateral processes that are currently being discussed or partially discussed and abandoned, that needs to be complete. To begin with, the binding treaty on transnational corporations and human rights that has been languishing for years within the UN system, I think we immediately need that like uh, signed and like, you know, enforced and with special attention to digital transnational corporations. Uh, the second thing is that we need a global digital tax regime that is just and equitable and does not permit base erosion and profit shifting practices of digital companies. We need a binding global consensus on human rights and the internet, especially in a moment where social media regulation uh, is really a very big uh, and uh, critical uh, point of uh, contestation. Uh, we also need to ensure that the internet's like essential architecture is independent and its governance through ICANN is truly internationalized and it's not just under the dominion of just one state as it is right now. And finally, we should say no to plurilateral e-commerce rules rulemaking that actually trade away the rights of the citizens of the South to powerful transnational companies. And this is extremely important since the ministerial conference of the WTO, uh, the 12th conference is coming up in just a few months. Next slide. Uh, I just want to uh, put my second and final proposal here, which is that because big tech is a business model that revolves around uh, data, uh, what we also need is a new direction for data governance and how we can socialize data value. This is the question we need to think through in this new direction. Firstly, I feel we have to break the de facto consensus that uh, data is a private property of the first movers or data collectors. And we have to have a way where we are striving for commensification of data. And this is much more than just preserving uh, privacy interest in the consumer contract between individual users and uh, the dig digital corporations. Now, when we think about commensifications, uh, we are uh, traditionally used to thinking of traditions where you apply common property resource regimes to natural resources which are finite and bounded. But how do we extend these, these traditions to intangible data commons? 
uh, because for intangible resources, the rules for exclusion and inclusion need to be different from what they traditionally were for natural resources, right? And especially because how do you de determine who is in a data community and where does the data community start and where does it end? And especially collective decision-making mechanisms if you start thinking of data as a shared uh, social resource. Uh, I know that in Europe, there are models like uh, Decidem uh, Barcelona, but in the global south, these models are like still very nascent. And I would actually say that more or less they are missing. And we need a lot of work on that because there is also the question of investments in public data infrastructure and how that's going to be supported and everything. So this is an urgent necessity for the south. Finally, data commodification needs boundaries, but I think the focus should never be forgotten on what it means when data enters the circuit of capital as an abstract object. So what is appropriable? What is inappropriable? What parts of data always have to remain in the public and you should not allow overbroad applications of uh, trade secrets? Who has economic claims in data if it is a shared social resource because it's not just the capital uh, investor, but it's also like the society from which data is generated. These are questions for which we don't have clear answers. And what's happening here is that the economic governance conversation around data is not being allowed to happen uh, by the status quoist because any mention of this tends to go in the direction of how uh, if we try to mess with this, it will just lead to very statist like assertions of data sovereignty and it would hurt civic political rights. And there is a red head heading that gets thrown in data circles when this conversation happens. And uh, we need to get past that and uh, you know kind of think, think this uh, question through. Now I come to my uh, final slide. At IT for Change, we've been doing quite a lot of a bit in trying to think through this uh, question and what it would mean to have a new digital new deal for the uh, South. And I just wanted to mention this so that in case any of you are interested, you can check uh, this out uh, later as well. Uh, and you know, also write to us at this ID for further conversations and so on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I really like this uh, notion of. Um... A digital new deal uh it's uh yeah uh you, you can keep on ah yeah yeah i thought you were you disappeared um so yeah we, we, before going into um your presentation I, I i would like to ask something about what was not in your presentation but uh what you do work on and, and publish on uh and that is uh that uh at it for change uh, you in particular also focus on, on, on gender as a lens to understand the critical issues in the in the digital economy. Uh, and my, my question is, can you explain what a gender perspective on IT uh, entails and what it uncovers in terms of issues? Um, uh, so could you well, very briefly walk us through what a, a gender perspective reveals? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that uh, because there is no one uh, feminist tradition and there are multiple feminisms, I don't think we can talk in terms of a gender perspective. However, I think I would like to explain what is our gender perspective at ID for Change and where we uh, start from. So typically what tends to happen in uh, the mainstream digital uh, debate uh, is that Gender gets often reduced to a question of looking at access to technologies from a gender lens and looking at intersectional barriers at that level, or more recently in data and AI, trying to look at how these technologies amplify and reinforce existing uh, bias and discrimination, right? But we also believe that at IT for Change, because our starting point is that the technological is not just like an artifact. It's also a paradigm shift, right? Because it's a mode of production and distribution that's getting transformed in the digital. And this also has implications for how social organizations and institutions are getting formed because we come from the starting point of digital capitalism as an institutional system. So in within that system, what would it mean to think about gender justice? This 
would actually mean that economic justice and gender justice are two sides of the same coin, like many Southern feminists from the Southern feminism uh, tradition have argued. And we also believe that we have to have an intersectionality perspective that is structural and not just limited to the question of like uh, misrecognition, but also addressing uh, maldistribution. So from this perspective, uh, when we analyze our work, which is why we also look at e-commerce debates and try to see how, let's say, there's a certain kind of pink washing, or what would it take for uh, women's interests to be actually protected? <clears throat> and we recognize women that uh, they are also embedded in a particular political economic order. And for uh, women in the global south, the uh, political economy cannot be forgotten in the digital when we are talking about furthering women's empowerment and gender equality. Thanks a lot, Nandini. Um, so to all attendees, if you have a question for Nandini, you can post it uh, in the special Q&A tab, which you find at the bottom of your screen. And uh, my next question, Nandini, is on e-commerce, which you mentioned in your presentation, uh, and the digitalization of the Global South. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit what e-commerce exactly is? What does it exactly encompass? Uh, and also, uh, what are the effects of the rise of e-commerce in the global south? To what extent is it visible and what's going on in, in the different continents? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, we start from the, uh, I mean, classic definition of e-commerce as uh, uh, a digital trade and goods and services, which is increasingly having a mammoth like share of uh, global trade. And when we look at the impact of e-commerce on the global south, uh, we begin to recognize that e-commerce is not just some narrow internet layer, right? Because as more and more parts of the real economy platform is, uh, become platformized, uh, we see that uh, whether it is like a food retail business or whether it is different kind of like, you know, labor brokerage, like the classic digital labor platforms, uh, or whether it is like tourism or or health or education or any classic uh, services, uh, everything becomes digitally transacted. So e eventually we will move towards an economy where almost all activities intersect with e-commerce at some point. So this is the starting point. And uh, what we see right now is that since the lead firms in these value chains of e-commerce, in these digitalizing value chains, are platform lead firms from either mainly the US and China, or occasionally uh, big unicorns in the global south, like uh, what Geo uh, wants to be in India, uh, we will see a skew of value where more and more there is a tendency towards monopoly in all parts of the uh, economy. Economy, right, like that is an effect if of naturally allowing unrestricted, completely hyper liberalized uh, cross border e commerce because it's a new age manifestation of the old problem of hyper liberalization of global trade without any market access uh, controls. That's how we see this. Uh, and I want to say that for the global south, it's very important now to determine uh, how these rules are being uh, made. For instance, uh, if you have to give full market access rights to all, uh, let's say, digitally traded services, then you will be opening up a lot of like uh, areas where later on you might want to assert like controls, right? Like, for example, take the e use understanding on computer related services which it wants to like enforce in all trade deals now if all computer related services get uh, hyper liberalized right at the outset uh, a country may not realize what is it that in a future age another sector might also get uh, traded mm. digitally right and then you're actually giving away large parts of your uh, i mean economy and you're exposing large parts of your economy. So the whole point is that the rules for e-commerce that we make now will affect like the economic interests the, of the global south for a long time to come. And so it's very important to preserve that policy space and not get pushed into a corner through plurilaterals or through even regional uh, trade agreements because it's important to protect economic sovereignty. This is the point we come from. And uh, like I mentioned, there are like very specific provisions in these agreements. We are concerned about unrestricted cross-border flows and this uh, market access to all computer-related services. Then a complete, uh, you know, a permanent uh, moratorium on, let's say, the tariffs on electronic uh, transactions that's being talked about at the WTO uh, and things like this. 
Just one short follow-up question, if I may, Rodrigo. So to summarize, uh, I mean, this WTO uh, agreement might actually lock in a certain um, stance uh, of deregulation, right? Which also implies that there's a precedent for other sectors that might still arise, which means that they will be automatically liberalized, for example. Uh, are the Global South countries aware of this and are they united in uh, criticizing the current agreement or are there other countries that are critical about the negotiations and do they stand a chance to stop it or to change it fundamentally? Uh, yeah, uh, so to give a brief answer to that question, uh, I wouldn't say that all countries of the Global South are critical about the plurilateral negotiation. Firstly, I want to clarify, it's not a multilateral process at the WTO, it's a plurilateral, so only some select group of countries have joined, uh, led by US, uh, Japan, Australia, the classic set of uh, trade allies. EU is also in that block, unsurprisingly. And one surprise entrant was China uh, last year. And the main uh, opponents uh, have been uh, India and the African bloc, South Africa especially. So there was a push to get a work program on this and like, you know, to start many other things in the last ministerial in 2017 in Buenos Aires. But thanks to the efforts of India and the African bloc, that didn't go through really, I mean, any at the WTO ministerial, which is how the plurilateral process got strengthened because the whole thinking is that in a plurilateral, if you start making rules and those rules will become the new norms and people who are not at the table cannot come and change them later, right? Mm -hmm. But India and uh, Africa have been consistently, South Africa have been consistently uh, fighting this. Uh, and uh, I also want to say that uh, uh, sometimes it's often like a very difficult choice if this trend continues because there's always this tricky question of should you stay out or should you be like you know in that process because which is like the lesser of the two evils right so it's quite yeah. uh, hard for the uh, south interesting thing so those are the same countries actually that are fighting against the uh, big pharma patents right now south africa and india so it's a good coalition uh, rodrigo up to you yeah i, I will continue a little bit uh in the same line of, of discussion, um, yeah. My, my question is, 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 yeah, it's basically about the geopolitics of this uh, and and what we can learn from from India. Uh, so, what, I I see India as being stuck between the Chinese and the U.S. Uh, yeah, big tech firms and 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 what we know from the academic literature on on these big tech firms and digital monopolies is that. Um, they seem to operate intertwined as a sort of infrastructural core, one from the US and one from China. So you cannot have really a mix uh, of these platforms, but well, one of them has to become dominant or hegemonic. Uh, and so there, there seems to be some sort of a well, struggle in, in, in India and as, as, as well as in other uh, parts of, of the world. But what can you tell us about this struggle between Chinese and US big tech firms uh, and, and, and what does it mean uh, for, for, for India? Um, I think uh, that's a very uh, interesting uh, question. It's also a difficult question, uh, I feel, uh, because uh, I, I think that uh, we have seen that uh, play out in uh, investments, like I already mentioned, because uh, until the foreign investment law changed in India, most of the startups were actually funded by like, you know, uh, the Chinese like uh, tech uh, companies or their arms and the, um, almost over half of them had Chinese investments. And uh, post the change in the law that there was like more control on investment from China, again, for geopolitical reasons and change in national policy on that, uh, you, you could actually uh, see that, uh, I mean, it's it's been like a little difficult to get Chinese investments. And you can also see, uh, let's say Google and Facebook uh, uh, coming in more and announcing more investments and things like that. Like we can, we can actually see that in India in terms of investments. Uh, but I also want to uh, answer your question from uh, another perspective that I feel that just like EU uh, is trying to show a new way, even though EU has probably 4% in the digital economy, trying to uh, follow a new path of techno sovereignty or something to protect its interests, I feel India is also trying to carve out its own policy path in terms of showing a new approach to commensifying data, looking at non-personal data 
data governance. There's a committee uh, on which like uh, one of the uh, IT for Change's uh, ex uh, executive directors, Parminder Singh, he was also a member on this committee of experts that's uh, coming out with the non-personal uh, data governance, uh, uh, I mean, report and looking at a new approach to regulating it in a way where from big capital, their uh, data enclosures can be opened up and more domestic firms can be encouraged, can data trust be set up, can we look at like a community data, like, uh, you know, com a more commonsified approach to data approach. This is all very nascent. And of course, there are like, uh, I mean, certain gaps in India's own data policy, like the lack of personal data protection and inattention to those parts of the data question. That is a problem in India's approach. But there's also so much here where there is a particular strategic thinking that uh, we need data resources to grow the digital economy and we need to be kind of rethinking our uh, IT and ITES services uh, traditions to make good in the data and AI age. So that way I feel that India is still because of its population size, market size and so many other advantages and uh, I mean the workforce and like domestic talent in a position uh, compared to many other countries in the South to carve out its own way. I feel the possibilities are there. Uh, so I'll continue with, I think, one more question uh, before we go to the Q&A, because there's already a lot of good questions uh, by the attendees. Uh, and my question is about gaining, regaining control, Nandini. So you spoke uh, of the, uh, the independence of the global internet. Uh, I mean, that's, I think, a very uh, far away ideal if you look at the economic governance and the power of big tech these days. So how can we achieve independence of the global internet and that's a very broad question but perhaps you could give us some uh, building blocks what what are the necessary presuppositions of getting there and what does it imply for uh, breaking with the current system uh, yeah, so in that, uh, I was actually coming from uh, two points in mind. One is that when we look at the technical governance of the internet, the current uh, state of affairs where ICANN is still within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, that does not like make the internet like, you know, completely international or global in uh, nature. So the move to internationalize ICANN by giving it jurisdictional immunity from the US, which was a conversation that was that has been happening in the technical community for a long time that should all actually take place and uh, we need a system like that where the uh, internet is uh, seen as a global architecture and not something where you know us can just like switch off things because you know as part of trade sanctions and things like that like that should not be even theoretically uh, possible uh, the second uh, point i think which is important for the internationalized uh, uh, internet is that uh, oftentimes when we talk about governance of social media, especially there is a lot of concern that a lot of national regulation will fragment the internet and there are all these concerns, right? Especially content governance measures. And there's also like a, a real and anxiety about increased state control. So I feel that we need a global human rights consensus about what it means to extend human rights to the internet layer. And just like in, uh, every other, like, you know, uh, pre-digital uh, human rights debate. We need this civic political rights uh, uh, consensus. And then finally, we need to like completely separate this conversation about a free internet uh, and having like, you know, this economic uh, governance of data conversation, because this typically tends to get like mixed up in very unhelpful ways all the time, because whenever anyone talks about uh, cross-border data flows and tracking them or measuring them or like doing things with them, then uh, we start getting into this conversation about, oh, don't even touch that because that means the internet will fall apart and it will become unfree. I mean, we need to have a way to clearly separate this out. So we're going to start with the most nearest question by Lena Deser, which is, and you can also read it. Oh, sorry. First, you can actually see uh, who won the poll, which is a forum hosted on the Crash Course website. Okay, that's interesting to know. I will take it into account. So now we're going back to the question of Lena Deser, um, which you can also read, uh, Nandini, if you click on the Q&A tab, that makes it easier to answer, perhaps. So 
Could you elaborate, Nandini, further on the ways in which colonial structures and global inequalities are reflected in digital financial services or fintech? And what is your opinion on approaches such as financial services for the poor in development organizations? Uh, yeah, um, I think that, uh, you know, in, in specific, because we have only a little bit of time, um, I would uh, uh, really like uh, talk about like what is coming out of studies of M-Pesa in Africa for uh, in the African region, for uh, instance, uh, that uh, when we look at like uh, finance uh, platforms and like, you know, uh, how they get uh, designed uh, for feeding a certain kind of predatory lending uh, apparatus where you have more and more access to uh, bottom of the pyramid uh, markets. Uh, I And uh, these access is deep, being deepened through data, personal data-based uh, profiling of particular kinds of vulnerabilities. I Feel the design of fintech services that go in these directions is itself a sign of like a colonial uh, architecture and it is like certainly like perpetuating certain forms of like uh, uh, debt and uh, you know completely like you know emiseration uh, of uh, people and all these things. Um, I, I also want to say that uh, when we look at like you know the design of financial uh, products at least in India there is this uh, thing that we are noticing that uh, we have this uh, National Rural uh, Livelihoods Mission where the government as part of a livelihood uh, program has uh, formed like women, women's cooperate, uh, cooperatives or women's collective study actually in many parts of the country and the uh, idea is that these will function as savings and microcredit groups and uh, women will get opportunities to further livelihoods and everything because they are getting these small loans. Now there, is, there are proposals that are coming within the scheme where this entire data that the scheme would have collected over the years, right? On top of that, there will be public-private partnerships to build, like, you know, friendly financial products and things like that. Now, what does this actually mean? And uh, oftentimes in many of these contexts, there are not like enough checks and balance and institutional protections. So I feel that's really the risk in such projects also, which was also part of uh, Lena's uh, question. Thank you. Uh, Rodrigo, will you take a second? <clears throat> yeah, sorry, very briefly uh, as a follow up on, the, on, on this question. Um, so, would, would you say that this particular part of fintech, uh, yeah, relatively simple payment systems, uh, that, that that is uh, one of the mode of entrance of big tech in, in many parts of the developing world, uh, which is different from how it enters the global north where of course you have much more developed banking systems and people do not need fintech for for, for for payments or payment operations and and so would you say that that is also a, a very well characteristic form in which big tech manifests itself in in developing countries yeah, I actually wanted to say that uh, I do not know a lot of like uh, in-depth uh, understanding about this because I have not looked at this in such detail. But one thing that uh, I have seen from like the overall reading or observation is that I feel there are differences even within the global south. Like for instance, in India, where traditionally the government had a very strong rural bank network, like nationalized banks, right? And the government had actually set up even a digital payments uh, corporation and completely like, you know, made this payments architecture uh, as a joint initiative of the central bank of the country, which is the Reserve Bank of uh, India, and with like public sector banks. So uh, this used to look very different in India. But now we have like new proposals where we want to like create like, you know, a plurality of digital payments architecture through consortiums, which are backed by big tech and commercial banks. And this is that proposal that is uh, floating around. And it's also been criticized by some Waters because what does it mean to do that and then to have like some kind of uh, fluid multi-stakeholder governance mechanism to uh, govern these uh, new aid structures, which are called new umbrella entities. So this is what is happening in India, for instance. So it was not like this, but the landscape is changing. Uh, but in the African region, for instance, where we know that uh, mobile payment services used to fill this much needed gap where 
banking infrastructure was like slightly uh, weak or maybe absent in many places, then you can see that trajectory coming in a completely different way, right? Like there would have been uh, telecom companies which would have got into the digital payments uh, business. And then over time, they are in uh, cooperation with other big tech uh, companies to launch like, you know, digital farm integrated services solutions. Like there are studies of these things if in the African context for uh, instance. So I feel that, yes, it is one of the routes, but I do not know if the trajectory is like, you know, they are so similar that we can, uh, you know, generalize that. Yeah. Sorry, I, I would like to go to um, one of the, uh, another question uh, from uh, Loana Alexandra Tuta, if I pronounce it right. Uh, can you elaborate more on the point about the need to have a consensus on human rights and the internet? What actors should be driving that process? And what uh, uh, are the areas where consensus is needed, is her question. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, to keep it uh, really brief, my uh, starting point is that the current uh, way of governing the internet through this loose process called the Internet Governance Forum, which is basically a multi-stakeholder uh, setup where there are no concrete ways to achieve actionable policy outcomes, that is not like taken as anywhere. So when we talk about human rights on the internet, I think it's the classic set of uh, rights the ICCPR to begin with, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So what it means to talk about free expression and internet free from uh, surveillance uh, and internet where civic political liberties are protected and not to forget the fact that everyone should have a right to internet access and that access should be uh, universal and that access should be unrestricted, affordable and equal. And we should not be really talking about programs like free basics or zero services that give only part of the internet or part of a walled garden to people as like equal access. I think all this entire gamut of uh, issues like would should be considered when we talk about human rights on the internet. So at some level, it might be like uh, you might need multilateral consensus for certain things like the civic political rights part and maintaining a basic level of like, you know, common minimum uh, program to ensure rights violations don't happen. At the other end, there are also like the hard questions about like, what about the old question of technology transfer? What about the support and development assistance that the countries of the North have towards countries of the South? How do you ensure you will resurrect ideas like the Digital uh, Solidarity Fund, which were like, you know, anyway jettisoned after the visits to come back and to give access to all? Uh, it, it's a whole range of things we need to jointly think about. Sorry, just because we are um, almost, uh, uh, we, we have made a full hour. Uh, Sarah, would you, would you like to continue? Perhaps we can try to do three more questions. Three more questions. The, yeah, then, then the, <laughs> the answer should be a little bit more brief uh, or uh, everything a little bit more condensed so we can at least, well, let's try to do two. Okay, three. I'm going to start right away with uh, Michael Huxman. Uh, digital uh, commodification, fabulous. I need to learn more of this. Seems to depend on some level of digital inclusion. Given the paradoxes of digital poverty, like lack of access, etc., and digital colonialism, every click becomes monetized elsewhere. Whose comments will be valued as a shared resource in semi-sovereign data communities? Nandini. Yeah. Um I, I, uh, I actually uh, think that uh, when when we talk about who's commons, so uh, I'm, I'm just coming from the other direction that it is our data co commons that has been collected and mined through the shared platform infrastructure that has now been enclosed and it looks like big tech's property. So how do you like open up that enclosure and like all those participating in the creation of that data, all those who are affected by the future uses of that data-based intelligence, how do we ensure the value creation happens for that and not in the balance sheets of big tech. I think that's the common specification we are talking about. I have another question. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot read the name. Uh, it's in a sign I cannot read, but um, which legal mechanisms are available to governments to intervene in platform infrastructures? What are the limits of these mechanisms? 
how do the limits differ between countries and why? What are the perceptions and experiences of, of governance actors in the global south uh, as to differences in these capabilities? So these are many, many, many questions. Um, but maybe from this nebula of questions, you can try to um, come to, uh, uh, to an answer. Uh, okay, uh, so I, I agree that uh, different the Global South is not a homogeneous entity and different countries are differently positioned in that political economy to kind of act. And what, for instance, uh, China might have been able to do or China can do today, or maybe what India can do, that's not probably open for smaller countries. And the whole fact that we should be looking at like, you know, regional integration or having regional data infrastructures and economic pathways that try to also like build through uh, what has what is being attempted in the EU, for instance, or even in Africa, in the Africa uh, continental uh, agreement, and maybe even a digital strategy around that. Maybe we need to think of like uh, new strategies like that based on where uh, one is located in that entire uh, geopolitical scheme. Yeah. Should we uh, do a last one? Yeah, and then we will do the question by um, Taishi Mishra. Please comment about the way in which government's response to the pandemic has been influenced by big tech and the possible consequences of the alliance. Um, okay, uh, so I think that uh, in the new normal of the pandemic, uh, in the name of uh, public health surveillance, of course, it has made easy for the, the government, gov for governments everywhere to do a lot of like uh, things in terms of uh, citizen surveillance. Uh, at the same time, uh, I also want to caution that there are many sectors where big tech's power has been demonstrated, whether it is the fact that, you know, th there is a rising market capitalization even amidst the pandemic or their takeover of key sectors or in the case of uh, India, like in one of the pieces I had shared, where uh, e-commerce companies enjoyed an essential services exemption and they were able to consolidate at the expense of traditional retailers in food value chains. So this means a micro retail landscape of uh, India can no longer be the same, right? Like that's what it means when their power consolidates and they will edge out all the smaller players and the tendency towards monopoly in the economy uh, grows uh, harder. So I feel that as civil society, there's a lot of attention right now to checking government surveillance powers in the pandemic and rightly so. But uh, my plea is that we should also pay equal attention to the fact that Capital is no different defender of people's rights. And the, I mean, perforce, we are forced to ensure uh, that capital is regulated. And uh, we need to be like cautious in our advocacy demands about that as well, about how can we ensure governance of the transnational digital corporation. That question we cannot forget. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nandini. Uh, I see there's also a question in the chat whether we can continue the discussion by email afterwards. So our answer is, um, we are hoping to establish this uh, chat forum for you guys uh, because we know that there's a lot of uh, need for continuing discussions also after crash course. Uh, what we could do perhaps is uh, refer to all the articles uh, that Nandini has written to IT for Change on our website. Uh, the links will be shared in the chat in a moment. And of course, you can also uh, ask questions perhaps through the Twitter account of IT for Change. Maybe that's a good idea to continue this interesting discussion. Uh, so for now, uh, I'd like to thank you so much, Nandini, uh, for this uh, brilliant uh, explanation and in-depth discussion. We've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be put online for those of you who'd like to watch it back or who are not able to attend today. We'll also put a podcast version there uh, and some show notes uh, with articles uh, that you refer to Nandini or that you'd like to put us online. Uh, I'd like to thank all attendees also very much for participating uh, in this crash course on Big Tech. And our next one is on the 17th of June at 4 o'clock, and it's on Big Tech versus the public. So it will go also even deeper into uh, regulating Big Tech. And the speaker of that session will be Francisca Bria, who is the president of the Italian National Innovation Fund. Uh, and an Italian information technologist who lectures at various universities and is also a consultant at the UN and European Commission. 
Uh, now, before we close off, uh, Nandini, I realized I didn't really ask you this beforehand, but maybe you could think of something now. Is there a specific question you'd like to ask uh, Francesca or is there a specific topic you're interested in that we can um, address the next time that we will be talking to her? Uh, yes, I would like to ask Francesca, how can we replicate the uh, experience of Decidem Barcelona and those experience in the global south? And how can we claim data cooperativism in those contexts? That's more or less the same question, like how do we achieve world revolution? So <laughs> I think I like it a lot. I'm very much looking forward to her answer. Uh, so thank you again so much, uh, Nandini. We'll start off with that question uh, in two weeks' time. Let me just quickly uh, share my screen so I can show all of you our lovely website, which is this one, um, crashcourse.org. Um, if you go there, uh, you can subscribe yourself to uh, the next session, which you can find here. If you click on it, you can go here, sign up now. And if you go um, to the bottom of our website, you can also sign here to sign up for our newsletter so you won't miss anything uh, also in our perhaps next series. So that's it for today. We'll come back to you all also regarding the result of the poll and the poll will also be spread uh, through the email. So uh, we're hoping to receive even more answers. Uh, we'd like to thank you again today, Nandini, and we hope to see everyone in two weeks time. And Nandini, um, we'll send out a link for you in a sec for a small after talk of this webinar. See you all soon. Bye bye.